I'm going to pass it off to Yasmin Cruz Farine, our co-founder and general partner at Visible Hands, and she will start with our welcoming remarks. So can we hear some energy, some Ooh. round of applause? It is a Monday. We're all here. Good morning, everyone. I have to begin with some really important shout outs. First, I want to give a big shout out to the BKXL Invisible Hands teams. They have been working tirelessly to create the experience we have in store for you today. I also want to shout out the Barclays Center folks, Blue Pool Capital, JSI Sports, Brooklyn Nets, and the entire broader ecosystem of investors who have stepped out and stepped up to add value and enrich this program in the form of social capital and inspiration capital. I know it's 9 a.m. as Somia said, but can we give a round of applause to the behind the scenes team and everyone who helped get us here. <laughs> to help the founders, it's not just Somia's job. Can we all share in the hype man task today? And if you see someone looking slightly stressed out, just give them a high five and a you got this and it'll go a really long way. Next, welcome to each of you. Some of you came a few blocks from Brooklyn. Some of you actually took flights to be here, whether you came from near or far. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And you're about to see something special, the inaugural BKXL Demo Day. As Somia said, I'm Yasmin Cruz Farine. I'm one of the three general partners and co-founders of Visible Hands. For those of you who don't know us, Visible Hands is a venture capital firm that funds and empowers underrepresented founders building high growth technology companies. We provide capital and we provide hands-on support to those who are building early stage companies. Over the past three years, we have closed our first fund. We're raising our second fund and we've written over 40 core checks at the pre-seed and seed stage. We've sourced over 7,200 applications to our programs and built a predictable and growing pipeline of diverse founders. In doing this work, we've built many strong partnerships with leading companies, foundations, and investors who share our vision for the entrepreneurial landscape where talent and execution, not race and gender are the key predictors of success and it has been a very hectic three years and yet this partnership stands out for being strong impactful and meaningful we are fortunate to be working towards this future with Clara Wusai in the social justice fund in 2020 the Joe and Clara Sai foundation launched the social justice fund in Brooklyn New York with a commitment to focus on the economic lever as the catalyst for change one of the ways that SJF has demonstrated a bias towards action is through BKXL. This program is an aligned, valued, and jointly executed partnership between Visible Hands and SJF. The program at its core is actually Clara's brainchild. Over the past 10 weeks, we've been in the foxhole with the founders that you'll hear from today. We've been weathering the macroeconomic uncertainty together, growing together, building together with mentorship and insights from some of the leading investors in the world. As I reflect on what we're really here for, it's always the founders. These are the people who, in spite of fear, have, in de have decided to embrace the desire lines of their life. How many people here have heard of the urban planning or the architectural term desire lines? I actually would not have been someone who would have raised their, their hand. This, this term is actually fairly new to me. If you walk in Presidio Park or if you walk in Prospect Park, I'm actually from Boston. I don't walk hardly ever in any of those places, but you'll see a paved path with concrete and then oftentimes in a green space you'll see a path that's not paved but it's had a considerable amount of foot traffic and it's clearly contrary to what the designers had in mind but that grassy surface has become a new path and it's often the shorter path from A to B. 
What I like about this analogy is that entrepreneurship doesn't always mean being first, but it is the one that requires grit. And sometimes your shoes may get dirty or wet. And it's definitely not for everyone. But it's for the people who put one foot in front of the other and dare to make something out of nothing. All of the companies that will emerge from this current crucible will be more resilient, more durable, and more successful. Still, I have to remind you all that institutional barriers begin at day zero for overlooked founders. We all know the stats that women and people of color make up 70% of the US population and yet receive less than 5% of venture capital funding. It is also important to note that in these times that the, the capital tide doesn't recede evenly across sectors and geographies. Venture capital funding is down 51% year over year in Q1 of 2020. But it's also down 75% for black founders, 84% for Latinx founders, and 53% for all female founded teams. If I knew the panacea or the exact combination of words, believe you, we wouldn't hold them back. All I know is that in this economic backdrop, we need more people like Clara Wusai and entities like the Social Justice Fund to extend the table and bring tangible resources to bear when others are frankly retrenching. On behalf of everyone at Visible Hands, we are so honored and grateful to be part of BKXL and absolutely thrilled to meet each of you who are just casually hanging out on a Monday morning at Barclays Center. Um, thank you, Clara, for trusting us and our team and our ability to create community, for moving at an entrepreneurial pace and putting real capital to work. Over the course of, the mean of this morning, you'll hear from amazing founders who spent the last 10 weeks accelerating the growth of their companies. All of these founders are looking to solve big problems and go after even bigger markets. Quick housekeeping notes, there's actually reporters and the media in the room, so this conversation is on the record. And finally, we're about to hear from two intentional leaders, Clara Wusai and Andy Weissman. I'm going to give a non-comprehensive <laughs> take on your background. Clara Wusai is a businesswoman, owner of multiple sports teams, the WNBA's New York Liberty, NBA's Brooklyn Nets, and the San Diego Seals, a lacrosse team an investor and philanthropist. She is a graduate of Harvard Business School, both a degree holder and trustee at Stanford University. What all of you should know about Clara is that she has an unwavering commitment to economic opportunity. Whether you're bouncing a ball or an idea, Clara is working on making Brooklyn home to brilliant new companies and technologies. Andy Weissman is a managing partner at Union Square Ventures. Andy began his career career in the internet in the mid-90s at AOL, and we said we can both hear the sound of the modem when we say that. Prior to joining USV in 2000, 2007, great year, he co-founded Betaworks. Union Square Ventures has backed more than 100 startups, but I'm only going to name a few. Twitter, Etsy, Stripe, Coinbase, MongoDB, and Carta. Andy is, as you guessed it, as you guessed it, from Brooklyn and is also decades into making sure Brooklyn can be fertile ground for inspiration and activation for future generations of Brooklynites. Please join me in welcoming Clara and Andy to the stage. Am I sitting here? In this? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and um, thank you, Yasmin, for that um, introduction to the day. Um, I guess today, in a way, is a bit of a commencement or a graduation for the founders, although there's one big pitch standing between you and graduation. So <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, to hearing about all of your, uh, your, your businesses shortly. Um, 
Uh, I, I did want to, well, thank you so much, Andy, for being here. Um, as Yasmin said, I think there's no one better, really, to be on this stage to talk about your experiences. And, um, you know, I do love the fact that you are born and bred Brooklyn. I think third generation, I think Andy's grandparents came here through Ellis Island on both sides of his family. Uh, and so... Um, his parents were born and bred here, Andy was, and his children are also growing up here. So you know, to me, Brooklyn means resilience and succeeding against the odds. Uh, that's why I love having this accelerator based here and also having Andy uh, be our featured speaker today. Thank you. So, Glad to be here. Um, so just to slide in um, with an icebreaker kind of question, um, is there any significance to the name Union Square Ventures? Is there a reason why you specifically referred to New York City. Yeah, there is, and I think it's it's somewhat related to why we're here today in some ways. When the firm was founded about 16 or 17 years ago, one of the observations uh, that my partners had was that the, uh, the internet ecosystem, or particularly the funding ecosystem, was geographically overweighted to the West Coast, Silicon Valley in particular, uh, Palo Alto to be even more specific. Um, and their insight, or their idea, was that the opportunity was broader than than a geographical focus um, may have may, was required, uh, and in fact, their it, second insight was New York's the greatest city in the world um, for a couple reasons. One is, I mean, look at this. We're on the stage at Barclays, right? Bucket list. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, but there are multiple industries, not just technology, advertising, media, finance, and and so the idea was, could you start a venture firm and name it after New York City to you know put a flag in the ground that that opportunity to create um, startups wasn't geographically focused anymore. Um, you know, a couple decades later, I think they were right. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so... So tell us a little bit about the role of an institutional investor like Union Square Adventures in this ecosystem of startups and um, you know entrepreneur early stage entrepreneurship. Yeah, I think that I think that over the past couple of decades, the role of an institutional investor or a venture capitalist has gotten. Um, slightly, I don't want to say overstated, but slightly distorted, meaning that our role is a secondary role. It's not a primary role. I, we view, I view this business as a services business. We're in the service of entrepreneurs. If our entrepreneurs don't have the resources they need to thrive and succeed, then we failed at what we do. So I think the role of an institutional investor is obviously to give capital. That capital is vitally important. It's like oxygen, but it is a commodity. You can get capital from many, many different places. And then the other things that are as important, which is to service, provide service, provide guidance, provide support. That may be technical, it may be emotional, it could come from a couple different places, but I think the role of an institutional investor is best thought of as um, maybe even a producer of a movie. You know, you see movies and you know who the actors are, but if someone said, who is the producer of, I don't know, Top Gun or whatever, I'm not sure you could say. I like that. I like that as a description of it, where our, our job is to, is to be supportive of someone else maybe even anonymous if we need to be, um, but not primary, secondary. Okay. The capital obviously is a huge part of it, but it's not all there is. Okay, so I'm curious, um, since you've been in the VC industry and also really the, you know, the internet business for a long time, you know, what would you say are some of the most significant changes that we've witnessed? Um, you know, in the whole startup landscape. I think, you know, my, um, I was thinking about it this morning when I was coming over here. My grandfather was an inventor. He, he invented stuff um, and then he would patent it and then he would like sell the patents for like a dollar or ten dollars. Um, and I remember when I was growing up thinking like, well, some of these ideas were pretty good. Why didn't he like, you know, start a company around them and stuff? And I think part of the reason was there was no infrastructure. That idea was audacious. And one way to think about the internet is like the great greatest library of all time that is largely free or accessible if you have any device. And so the thing that's changed over the past 10 or 20 years is you just have this incredible library of information that you can search to get resources. You actually can get to people too sometimes. When I was younger in my career, and I still do this, I try and like find people that are interesting to me and email them and see if I can get a response. And every now and then you do. A lot of times you don't. Um, but the internet allows us to kind of access to people. Um, 
access to information, access to what is a startup, what should your burn rate be, what is marketing. I had an interesting conversation about advertising on subways just before I came here. All this stuff is out there, you know, and I think that's a dramatically different world than existed. An amazingly beneficial world because that information which used to be exclusive and hard to get and maybe proprietary is open and I think that's really a good thing and that's changed a lot. It, for, as an investor, it's required us to be better at our jobs because you all can like research who we are and what we do and what companies we backed and the mistakes we've made. We can't hide behind those too. So I think that like open playing field of information is really about anything but for the purposes of this like what is a startup? How do you start a company? What are the things you should be thinking about? It's a great place to get started and help and that's a huge difference than 10 or 5, 10, 20 years ago. And probably perhaps led then to maybe uh, you know more people then do you think, and think entering so. this ecosystem yeah, I think so I think so yeah. yeah I mean when I was at when I was at uh, AOL early in my career we, we were doing some investing um, and someone gave me this thing they're like here's a term sheet go negotiate the term sheet I'm like I have no freaking idea what a term sheet is you know and I was like freaking out um, and so I just asked people which is fine but now imagine you go into Google you know and, and or chat GPT and say what's a term sheet you know and get information I think that's that's is, is the so possibility of opening things up. In so maybe the barrier to entry, I mean, it's still going to be hard to raise capital, but maybe the yes. barrier to, to entry to even just try to... Barrier to start. Yeah, barrier to start is lower. Yeah, yeah. I think so. So let's go right into the fundraising environment. Um, well, maybe because there's also so many more people in it, you know, it's um, extremely competitive. So, of course, there's traditional metrics that are very important, like revenue, um, growth, growth in customers, growth in all sorts of those metrics. Um, but how do you feel the early stage startups can really differentiate themselves? I think that, um, I think as, and before I was at AOL, um, I had a startup too, and I was talking to Yasmin that when we started our company, we, we, we talked to 100 investors and 98 said no, you know, um, and, and so, which is kind of like, it's not atypical, it's kind of maybe, this is the way it is or the way it should be, but I think you're, you're if you think about it, you're, you're, you're one of the jobs as an entrepreneur is you're trying to convince someone to back you with their time time, with their energy, and with their money, which is probably the three most important resources an investor can have. And so what you're trying to do is to explain why it's a good business, but you're also trying to explain why you are the right person to do that. And I think that largely comes down to is what's the insight about the world that you have that is something maybe someone has not heard before. That's, that is probably provocative. It's definitely audacious, and I think it's okay that it, it may seem like it can't succeed. Um, because if we want, investors wanted to invest in things to succeed, we can buy T-bills, and by the way, those are five or six percent right now. Mm -hmm. Those are great investments. And so you, I don't think one should shy away from that, but you're kind of, you're explaining a value system and a belief system and an insight that you have that is original and provocative. And the metrics follow that, but at the early stages, you don't have metrics. So you're largely kind of explaining that vision and why you think it's unique and, and why you are the person, to, what insight did you have to come up with that? And that could be anything, right. but I think that's part of it, the personal journey too. You're having someone, and I think one of the things that, that as an investor they're evaluating or we're thinking about is, you know, can you convince under other people to come along on this crazy journey, because it's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, not just me, but other people too. You have to hire people, you know, partners, distribution partners, get into incubator programs, you know, get up on stage and pitch. So it's kind of a complex, you know, set of things like that, but largely I think it's the story you're telling about the opportunity and who you are and why someone should give you their time and their money. Yeah. It's hard. It's yeah. brutal. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's you're right. And it's not just the idea itself, but it's really how you're able to uh, to tell it, to pitch yeah. it, and your ability, as you said, I think, to attract um, the best people to help you realize your vision. I always think that's that a whole like other one, skill one, of the, set. one of the analogies that that I like to think about when you're, you know, when you're talking to an investor, or actually when you're recruiting someone as well, it's kind of like you think about like you're you're going on a walk with them up a mountain, you know, and you're kind of taking them step by step up the mountain, and like where each step you're kind of getting closer to the top, you know, and then when you get to the top, you're kind of 
putting your arm around them and showing them the vista. And the vista is kind of like, imagine if all the things I described, you know, happen. Look how beautiful that, look at that rainbow over the vista. That's like the cadence of like a pitch to anyone, to me feels like that, you know, where it's kind of like, it starts low, you know, do I really want to spend time with you going up this mountain? And then you're like, oh, it's a little interesting. Oh, there's a little more interesting. Oh, come on, well, let's go. And then you get to the top and you're like, look at this beautiful vision of what the world could be. That's kind of like the cadence of it in a way. Right, so there's a lot of patience too. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's a spark of something. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, yeah, I think the vision, the visionary aspect is um, essential. Um, so one of the reasons that I wanted, you know, to speak with Union Square Ventures is, um, you know, obviously your, your founder, Fred Wilson, is someone that I've known for a while. And uh, I think we've been connected not just through an interest in entrepreneurship but also because he's such a great um, philanthropist too and and um, so you know in a way Union Square Ventures is is not surprisingly a bit of a um, in, in some ways mission driven and I would love to hear how you describe what a mission driven investment is I think that um, I, I think internally we we believe and we operate under the idea that we are a mission driven firm. I think we've we've what does that mean though? What does mission driven mean? You know, and um, and the way that we describe it or the way we think about what it means that I think is meaningful is that what are the things that that technology enables that could not have existed before? You start with kind of that base. We call those native applications, but it's like what are the things that could not have existed before that exist because of the internet? Um, and then uh, and then there are three buckets of those that we think are uh, meaningful. Uh, transformational, um, lucrative, and um, and I guess mission oriented, which is broadening access to capital, broadening access to learning, and broadening access to well-being. We have to put those three buckets. Um, and so the way we define it is the internet allows for broadening access to education, mm -hmm. learning mm -hmm. more broadly, capital, the money to do things, start businesses, live your life, and well-being, things that make you feel better, which includes health. But also sometimes it means things that make you smile and also can include climate. So we try and get very specific about that. And when we're looking at an investment decision, we'll say, do we think this broadens access to one of those three areas? We'll also debate what does learning mean? What does education mean? What is capital? Mm -hmm. You know, soft capital, hard capital, digital capital, what is well-being? Mm -hmm. And so we try to get very specific about it rather than um, operating at a more abstract level of, of a mission and what is a mission. For us, that's a little too abstract in looking at a particular opportunity. But those, and if you think about it, those three buckets are, are pretty broad too. Well, interesting. So you think well being is an area of. Um Profitable growth. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Some of those areas we've proven out more than others, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. We have to believe each one of those. Right. Are what's lucrative. just, you know, what's been an example of an investment in well-being that has been successful? Um, well, you know, you you you'd have to. Um, I'll, I'll give it. I'll give one that that covers both because it's interesting to us. It's a company called Duolingo, which allows you to learn languages, um, and um, and that's and that's broadening access to learning because you can learn a language with your phone from anywhere in the world. But it's also well-being because they they tuned it like a game. You know, the, their insight was to learn a language is really laborious, really expensive, takes many hours. What if like while you're waiting to go up on stage, I can learn a couple phrases in in French mm -hmm. or Spanish, um, mm -hmm. and that's game like. Mm -hmm. And so it happens to be a service that uh, that broadens access to learning, but actually kind of makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. If you think about the Duolingo, the mascot, you know, is like it's kind of funny, it's kind of goofy, and so that that's a way that covers both. Right. Yeah. A little bit of entertainment. And yeah. A little bit of absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Delivered through a phone, but yeah. yeah okay. Exactly. Um, We've made a number of investments more specifically in digital health that um, that um, that we haven't made money on yet but we're hopeful right. um, so speaking of wellness let's talk a little bit about founder wellness 
um, you know, in the VC space, it's a topic that's been, um, you know, in conversation more and more, and I think it's generally the notion of helping founders holistically. And it's something important to our partners, Visible Hands, and partners, and, and important to us. What does founder wellness mean to you, and what approach do you take to founder wellness? I think there's um, um, the way I like to think about it is the um, the process of starting a company. What many in this room are doing um, is um, a, a challenging um, and ambitious and audacious, but at some levels kind of ridiculous. You're creating something from scratch. Um, it, it may be the most rewarding thing you do, but um, but it comes with amazing roadblocks at every step of the way. One thing I've seen throughout my career is you, the high. You can have the highest of highs and the lowest of lowest many times in the same day. Right? Like one morning you're winning and by the afternoon you're like, I can't believe I'm doing this, right? And so how do you manage that swing? How would we as humans manage that swing? I've actually, it may be one of the situations where you're just, where you're, where you're, you're experiencing that roller coaster the most. I think the role of the investor is actually, plays a huge part, can play and should play a huge part in wellness because part of it is we've seen this. Like you're feeling this, it, that's okay, right? What, what was so high about the high? What was so low about the low? And I think the ultimate role of the investor is one is the trusted confidant, you know, the trusted partner where you can say, look, this is really bad or this is really good. And I think when we, when as investors, when we operate the best is when we recognize that as a form of wellness. Um, so I think that's one of the things. I think things like this cohorts of people, you're not alone, there are other people like you, the other people doing something you're doing is really important. Finding those people is incredibly important because the experience is very singular in that roller coaster of emotions. I think it's things like that. Community, I mean, I guess is what it comes down to. Importance of community. So what I heard you say is recognizing that there are highs and lows sometimes in the same day. And is it just to talk through it and say, well, maybe the low wasn't such a low? Is, is that what it is? And yeah. then to sort of put the highs and lows in perspective. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I think that like, you know, I, I, one of the things that I think is this idea that, um, that particularly uh, is applicable, I think, to a startup, which is momentum creates momentum. And so, and, and momentum can be momentous, but it also can be just like incremental things, you know, and there's a forward motion type of thing. And so, um, managing the swings to continue the forward motion, you know, sometimes the lows can be pretty bad, you know, they're never fatal because the wonderful thing about a startup is it's completely resilient. You get to react to the market. You know, the advantage that startups have over incumbents is that they create the markets they're in. You know, they don't, they don't lose except if they kind of, in a way, they decide, or, you know, they're mm -hmm. going to. And so you can kind of power through all those things. But I think you need a community around you because it feels and, and sometimes appears insurmountable. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, Right, it's the pivot, right? You can always pivot. Absolutely. Um, but having resources around you to gut check it or to navigate through how you're going to respond um, is is important. And yes, I think that's right. I think there is, it's part of this posse or cohort model. And that is something that we hope everybody does take away that even though you're in different stages um, of your businesses that you'll stay connected because there are always gonna be things to share. You're not alone. Um, there's always a solution. You gotta find the solution. That's, that's the difficult part. Um, and being part of a community where you, as a resource of tools for you to kind of get through that or find those things, it's pretty crucial, I found. Okay, so how, you know, go, looking forward, how do you see the VC landscape evolving? Um, any specific industries or categories? You know, you mentioned the three, well, in, in your mission-driven area, but just generally speaking, um, what are some exciting investment opportunities that you see? Well, AI, I guess, is yeah. one. Um, but AI, I would say, is one because um, because it may represent um, a platform shift. Um, by that, I mean, if you look at the history of computing, there are every 10 or 15 years, there happens to be a platform shift. And that platform shift typically results in ex an explosion of opportunity. Um, sometimes it results in an explosion of incumbents that don't survive that opportunity. So if you look back at the history of computing, 
we had mainframe computers, um, which was kind of the first large-scale application of, of digital technologies into our world. Um, then we had desktop computers in the mid-90s, laptops. Um, then we had mobile phones, um, and AI may represent one of those shifts, and if those ships typically change everything that came before it uh, in terms of the opportunity set. We don't know if that's the case, but there are attributes of it that, that feel like that, be, that may be the case. Um, I think that, um, but that can be a distraction um, because you've talked to a lot of investors, they'll talk about AI all the time, and you're like, well, I'm not an AI company. I'm you know, building a, a dialysis machine. I saw that on, on the list. Um, so, um, um, but it doesn't mean that there aren't specific opportunities in any digital technologies. Um, it's still our view, or my view, that we're, that we're in the early phases where digital technologies are transforming every industry. Um, it's still only been, you know, the mobile phone is, is 15 years, you know. Desktop computers that I mentioned are still only 30 years. It's very early in that. Um, and so I think there are novel ways to create opportunity in all those. AI is one that feels like it's a shift, so one needs to kind of, I think, pay attention to it, whether you operate under it or not. Uh, but again, we think like when we when we chose those categories, um, we thought those were large, robust categories where there could be decades of innovation in them. And so, and we and when we used we came up with those words, that was still only about six or seven years ago as our articulation of what we do. So I think all those are you know learning. You know, we were talking about um, uh, internally at USV. You know, imagine if everyone had a had a tutor, had their own personal tutor to learn technology enabled tutors. This is kind of a thought experiment. And imagine, you know, what could result from that yeah. as, an, as a specific well, example. Well, like making up learning loss and exactly. things like that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Have you seen anything promising there? Uh, early days. Early some. days. Yeah, yeah, some. Well, we needed it yet last yes. year, but yes. Yeah, big time. <laughs> yes, exactly. I know. Um, okay, great. Well, I was wondering, should we open up? I have more questions, but I also wanted to see if the audience wanted to ask any questions. Raise your hands. Um, Yasmin and I can come and bring the mics to you. So, any questions for Andy or Claire? Yes. Hey. Go on. Hi. Sorry, my name is Jarrell Sweet. I just actually had a question about um, we're in the space of uh, social impact, uh, alternative to gun violence, and I know those pitches can come off a bit different when you're pitching to someone in VC versus pitching to someone in the space of, say, government or um, you know, uh, social impact funding that doesn't come with a return. Um, so I'm trying to navigate that space now and would love any advice on how to pick that middle road rather than, the, rather than having to pick one or the other? Or do I need to pick one or the other? I mean, it's the interesting, you may have to pick one or the other. I mean, you know, I only, I only know like from, from our side, while, while we believe there's a very strong mission orientation to what we do, my job is also to get my investors' financial returns, and if I don't, I don't have a job, you know? And so, but it doesn't mean that one can have deep social impact and deliver a return. I think the question maybe for you is, you know, where, where do, you, do you believe there's, there's a, a financial return that can come from investing? If you are, then any investor like that is, is a good one, could be a good one, potentially. You know, now if you're not sure, you know, then maybe social impact is a place to figure that out too, as well, if that makes sense. Hi, um, I'm Laura Moreno. My name is Laura Moreno, and founder of HomeFlow. We are empowering employees to buy homes. And my question to you is like, based on the current financial market where people are just, it's very difficult for people to own homes. What have you seen, what kind of solutions have you seen are promising into financial literacy and empowering people to build wealth? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give you my short answer. None, none that I think have been materially impactful to solve kind of some of the problems you mentioned. 
Not really. And I think partially, though, um, it's because we're coming out of a period in home ownership where interest rates were so low that it was just easy to pump transactions through any system and not actually solve kind of maybe some root cause, you know? So now, even though it's much harder because interest rates are higher, it may be a better opportunity for those type of solutions. Which is why, if you think about home ownership, one of the, some of the companies that grew the fastest were, um, what were they called, I buyers or something, where they would actually buy your property and then flip it, you know, and, which is kind of that, that's that's a, a a solution that didn't solve anything you've mentioned, but was financial engineering. Hi, my name is Christy Felix. I'm the founder of U Hustle. It's an online marketplace for students to monetize their skills. My question is more about the barrier to entry for POC and women founders. You spoke about how um, venture funding doesn't really go to POC and women founders. How does one navigate that without giving up on their idea because it's hard to get funding? Or do you recommend more of a slow growth process for POC women founders? Um, what suggestions do you have for navigating the um, venture space for them. So I would I would say um, I would say two things. One is you're a founder of a startup, right? And so you do all the things that a founder of a startup needs to do to get people to believe in what you're doing and have the resources that you need and the funding. You know, that's no different than anyone else. The reality is, is as an industry, as Yasmin mentioned, we suck. Like we're not, we have failed. It, we have failed in investing in larger and more diverse groups of founders. Like period, full stop. There is no excuse or explanation. We suck. You know, which is kind of crazy because if you think that like we invest in innovative ideas and innovative ideas, there is a correlation that come from people that have different perspectives on them. It doesn't make sense. That doesn't help you per se, but I think you just got to like, you got to do your thing, you know, and your business and you believe it's a big company, an interesting idea that uses technology and, and part of the job of founders is just to convince people, you know, and push through those walls. The barriers though are higher because in the industry, we suck at this. And I hope we get better, but we just haven't been good. Hi, my name is Rosalie Gordon. Question for you for individual investors who are looking for founders like that who want to invest. Have you seen anything that works, anything on the horizon that works, or opportunities to connect with those founders? There's a large pool um, that we may not be aware of. Yeah, I think, I mean, so going back to what we said earlier, I think the good news is there are, there are many more and you can find them because we can just search for them and we can network at, for them, you know? And so, and so I think there are more available. I don't have quantitative data to suggest that. I just have my qualitative observations, you know? I would say that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, um, with respect to any inv any investor in any business, uh, part of the thing as a founder is you want, you're kind of qualifying a sales lead in a way, you know? Why might someone be, what do I know about someone um, in this world where we can search for anything that would lead me to believe they might be interested in what I'm doing? Who has invested in companies, you know, that are, that are helping college students to kind of, you know, get real world skills? or earn money, you know, who's done that, you know, who said they want to do it, who hasn't done it, you know, that might find it interesting. There's like that matching thing, but then the other layer on that matching thing is who are the investors that, that are being uh, forceful and aggressive, maybe about finding different types of investors. So we have time for just, hello? Okay. We have time for one last question. Wait, can, can, can I do it? Oh, yes, yes, okay, yes, I want to just end. I, I, just because I think this is... Introduce yourself first. I, know. <laughs> I, I did want to just ta uh, ask you about timing because I think this is really important that, you know, venture funds, you do, you, you know, you have a responsibility to the investors in your fund. So this is, this is really important. So I think when people go to market is actually really important. You know, like the, it, because it may not be ready yet. Right? You have to really um, show that you can grow and be profitable. Um, but just talk talk to us a little bit about timing and what factors should founders consider when they're thinking about when to go out. 
I think I think there's so so I would say there are two layers to it. There are there are there are investors that's including us that specialize in different stages for where you are. There are angel investors, there are pre-seed investors, there's seed investors, there's Series A, there's growth investors, and so you want to be talking to the right investor depending on where you are. You know that's the first thing. The second thing is, are are you at an inflection point? And sometimes an inflection point is I've had this idea, I've researched this idea, I'm ready to get going. Sometimes it's I've done that. I've hired a couple people, we have a couple customers, we have a couple users, so you have to articulate the inflection point for why, why, you, need the, why you need the capital, you know? And the third thing I would say is that um, other than that, markets kind of rage up and down and you can't time, there's no, there's no possible way to time that though you are aware of it. Um, you just have to kind of go do your thing when you do your thing. I would say that for, uh, you know, when our funds have a 10 year life cycle and our average hold period to liquidity event, which means that we've made some money for our investors, has been increasing over the past 10 or 15 years. It's seven or eight or nine years. And so when so when we make a decision, we attempt as much as possible, we're human, so it's hard to forget all the noise of where you are in the market cycle, knowing there could be five, there's gonna be five more market cycles before we realize whether this is, uh, whether this company works or not. Um, and so as a founder, I think you kinda gotta do the same thing. You wanna be aware of the world is because you're describing your solution you know, relative to what's happening, um, but the ups and downs are the ups and downs. Right now it's a low point, it's brutal. Uh, but I think though, we know from history that opportunity comes from that too. While it's still, I know this is just words, right? While it's still brutal, like investors are hearing fewer pitches for the business you're pitching at this moment. And maybe four years ago, we were hearing 20 for that. And so you have the ability to stand out, I think, in a different way. And so the timing is an odd one because you can't, you have to be aware of it, you can't control it. But also like when you're walking them up to the mountain and you're looking at that vista, that vista is 10 years away. Way. And, and investors know that. We're not getting returns on our investments monthly, yeah. a decade. Our first fund, which we just closed down, took 16 years to finish. Right. 16 years, and it was a spectacular fund. So they take time. So it's raising it and it's also just spending it in a in a way that it's going to last you, right? I, yeah. I think. Yeah. And last otherwise. you to like the here are the here are the here's what I want to do. Here's what I think this capital will get me will hap, what will happen with this capital. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to keep yourself honest well, too. The discipline. Right? Yeah, the discipline. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so awesome. much, Andy. Awesome. This is fun. It's really fun. Okay. Thank you. Let's hear another round of applause for Andy and Sarah.